Our next performer is leaving us, unfortunately. She's going far, far away to the farther south state that she could probably go to. Is Florida farther south? Yes. 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 The second floor farther south. Hawaii is even farther. Hawaii. The third farther <laughs> south state she could go just to get away from me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the former host of this reading. Ladies and gentlemen, Janet Kuipers. So I'll just like do it. Should, when, would when, you like one more or something? When, when the audience gets tired of you, I'll uh, pick you off. <laughs> you guys. Um, Are you tired of your career yet? No. Are you tired of your yet? No. Okay. <laughs> this is a piece that I read here shortly after my mother died in a feature. Um, and I don't have any, you know, I, I wanted to be able to share something from my past, from my performances here with you guys. This one is called Melt and Cried. I was in the minivan, Dad's new car, driven only 930 miles. Dad driving, sister in the front seat, me and brother in the back seat, my husband that behind me in the far back seat. I waited so we could go to my mother's services. Well. They weren't services, she didn't want that. But Dad thought the kids would want to see my mother before she was cremated. So there we were, the family, in ties, in black dresses, sitting and waiting for our little hearse to drive us to Fuller Funeral Home for our final visit. We were in the car, my husband was in the far back seat, and he knew I was sad. He sensed I was crying while the hearse took us to the funeral parlor, and he reached his hand forward to take my hand, to touch my shoulder, to something. And I couldn't see his face, but his hand was a grave consolation as our hearse rolled on to our chance to say farewell. I was trying not to cry in the ride in the hearse to the funeral home. I've been a good Marine. I've been trained not to cry, but I couldn't help the tears at that point. And I did my best to stifle them so no one would consider my sniffling and no one would question my faltering emotions. Once we arrived, I think we were all afraid to go into that room to see her. Well, I can't speak for anyone else. I know I was afraid. Afraid of what I'd see. Afraid of, afraid of I don't know what. Afraid of the finality of it all. Just afraid. So I'm the littlest one. Uh, of course I'd let everyone else go in before me. They're supposed to want to see her more. That's what I hear. And we walked in and there were so many seats and you could see her face asleep, peeking out of the coffin in the distance. And we all just instinctively sat down. Dad finally walked to her and knelt before her coffin. We watched him watch her, pray for her, talk to her. I, I don't know what he was communicating with her, but he was with her. We all wanted that with her one more time. One sister went next knelt, cried, then a brother, then another brother, and I watched the procession of family members, all older than me, all seemingly more important, all with more history with her than me, and, and my husband asked if I wanted him to go with me when I walked up to see my mother, and I thought, no, I need to do this on my own. I finally walked up to her, knelt before her, looked at her and in the dress that she wore to my wedding and thought she looked so beautiful. She looked so peaceful. She looked like she was sleeping and I hadn't seen her that peaceful in a long time. Every time I came to visit her since the disease started, she always looked tired when she was awake. Otherwise, she was asleep and looked fitful in her rest. I looked at her eyebrows, <laughs> they were penciled in very nicely, and I looked down at her nails, and they were long, very nicely painted. 
And, and the earrings we picked for her to wear were so dainty and so lovely, and she looked so peaceful, and that's all I could keep thinking, that she looked so well rested, and that she would just be taking a good nap, and she would be just fine. She had to be. I looked at my mother one last time. These coming thoughts would be my final words to her face. This would be the last one I saw her. Make it good, girl. You're the one with the words. Tell her what you mean in 50 words or less. That's how these services go, right? So I told her that I loved her. And I told her that I hope that I carry on any of her kindness because that's the way she'll live on. Because this world is filled with people who aren't nice, who aren't kind, and losing her makes this world a worse place. People have told me that I am kind, uh, that I am nice, and they only hope that I can do you justice, that I can somehow make this world a better place like you did. I only hope that I can do the world justice because the world needs you, Mom, now. And you had to go leave us. So what do we do now? Before I left her that final time, I, I started to run my hands along my chest into a cross because I wanted all of the spirits to know that you are there and that you are to be welcomed because you are blessed even if it's only from the likes of me. <laughs> and I said I have to make something happier, and even though um, my husband is not here, um, I thought I'd share this one with you. At 11 and 2 plus 8. Maybe I'm an observer, like an astronomer, looking out into the universe, trying to understand what makes everything, everything. Maybe I'm meant to be an astronomer, studying things colder than ice far away. You know, Pluto is an aberrant ball of ice. I don't know, I was taught it was a planet. But then they told me, no, it's not. It's just a ball of ice from the Kuiper Belt. <laughs> But molecule by molecule, we originate from stars. And now I know we are all linked, our bodies formed from stardust. But outer space is a violent place. Violent explosions create the stars. Our Earth has earthquakes, avalanches, volcanoes, tsunamis, typhoons. And in all of this madness, somehow I found you. I've survived the thunder and the lightning, the blizzards, the hurricanes, and the tornadoes. I've lived through the drought. I've survived it all. I've even been dealt a near-fatal blow from humanity. And with you, I've walked on the tops of glaciers, crouching down from the violent winds, looking down into the beginning of time. With you, I have watched solar storms from the geomagnetic aberrations of the aurora borealis from near the Arctic Circle. And we've looked at Venus through our telescope, and I've watched you photograph Orion in the night sky. And with these observations, I be wed. Because after all of my searching throughout the universe, I found what I've been looking for. <laughs> Um, our, um, I, I, I could make it four because I have a sad one and then a happier one if you'd like to do that. This one is called Timing is Everything. Timing is everything, you know. Just when you say you've had enough, just when you're ready to wave the white flag and step out of the ring and stop playing the game and stop feeling the pain because you're numb, that's when, for one brief moment, something wonderful happens and reminds you why you live and reminds you what hope and joy and even love is. And suddenly breathing is no longer a chore and suddenly nothing is a chore and suddenly there is no pain and suddenly remember what it's like to be alive and you start to like it. Well, that is when they pull a rug out from under you, right at that moment, so that you can fall to the floor and then feel a biting sting of pain that hurts that much more. Timing is everything, you know. 
They do it that way on purpose because they can't let you go on feeling hope and not feeling pain. This is the key. It's all on the timing. When we're walking in stride together down the street and our feet pump out the same rhythm and our shoulders are almost touching and our hands brush up against each other for one brief moment and he reaches over and takes my hand. When he slides his fingers around mine and I feel him move along the palm of my hand. Well, no one knows what it feels like when his fingers curl and hold me tight. Well, it feels like pop rocks. It feels like when that candy is sliding down my throat after I let it explode on my tongue and I'm, it's still tingling and nobody knows I'm eating this and nobody knows his feeling and this is my little secret. And it feels like <laughs> it feels like never before. I feel this feeling like never before and it makes me want to laugh and cry because I look around the room and no one is eating those pop rocks and no one knows the feeling when he's holding my hand. <laughs> Thank you very much.